Hey guys, so this is chapter 9 in 12.11. We are talking about uh, valence bond theory, which essentially what we want to do, we've, we've learned how to draw Lewis dot structures. We've talked about shapes, electron geometries, molecular geometries, bond angles, and all that kind of thing. Um, we want to dive in deeper now and talk about, okay, how do these bonds form? Why, uh, I don't know, how are S orbitals and P orbitals and D orbitals involved in bonding? You know, like, how does it happen? Essentially, there are two theories uh, that we need to talk about. Uh, the first theory that we're going to focus on is called valence bond theory. Um, it is a approach that is very qualitative. It just kind of gives us a nice picture, uh, hopefully some images to help us understand how bonding forms, how we get the bond angles that we talk about and all that kind of thing. Then in the net, like the, then that is chapter nine, B is the PowerPoint that we're gonna be talking about in a little bit. Um, and then in the next PowerPoint, which is chapter nine, part C, uh, is gonna be the other theory called molecular orbital theory. That theory is much more heavily based in quantum mechanics, actually gets into a lot of uh, math and quantitative analysis. Um, it's much more realistic in terms of how it approaches um, electrons moving from one orbital to another. Uh, when we observe light coming out of uh, an atom from electronic transitions, if we want to explain how all that happens, that's all based um, and explained in molecular orbital theory. Also, we get things like uh, magnetic properties, um, different colors of some materials have uh, different colors. We can explain why through MO theory. So that, that's a much deeper and uh, more mathematical approach. It's also a little bit harder to explain. Um, and so we like to start with valence bond theory. When you go to organic chemistry, this is a really important topic that they utilize in organic chemistry. So you need to uh, remember it when you get to that point. But, so we're focused on valence bond theory for right now. Uh, I'm looking at the CH4 molecule which I'll give you the form of CH4. You should be able to very quickly draw a Lewis dot structure for it. This is one of the easiest ones that we do. Um, if I look at CH4, again, there's a pattern that we've done a lot of times where the number of electron domains, which sometimes we call the steric number, uh, around the carbon atom, there are four different groups. So the steric number here is a four. If the steric number is a four, then we should know that a steric number of four always corresponds to an electron geometry of tetrahedral. And then if it's tetrahedral, we learned that the basic angle for tetrahedral molecules is 109.5 degrees. Now, that brings up an issue. If I have a bond angle of 109.5, where does that angle come from? What orbitals does carbon have that are gonna allow it to make bond angles of 109.5. Because essentially what we're saying, if I take that CH4 molecule, I, carbon's gonna have an orbital that it puts an electron in, hydrogen has an orbital that it puts an electron in, and when they overlap, those electrons are gonna be moving back and forth between those atoms. That's gonna be our bond between CH. It's a single bond it's formed by the direct overlap of electrons between carbon and hydrogen. So we're specifically going to call that a sigma bond. That's the Greek letter sigma. That's the first bond. And then if I have another hydrogen, instead of being, this picture makes it look like they're all 90 degrees apart. That's not right. If I draw this properly, it ought to be a little bit more than 90. So I'm going to draw my next orbital like that, the hydrogen its orbital overlaps with the carbon's orbital. They form another bond directly between the atoms. So this is another sigma bond. In this molecule, all the bonds are gonna be sigma bonds. Their overlaps directly between the atoms, okay? So that angle between these two bonds is about 109.5. Those are the only two I can put flat because if I have a tetrahedron, it's a three-dimensional molecule. So the next one that I draw actually has to come out of the board and there are certain ways, if you look at your book and look at uh, your drawings, that we can draw three-dimensional molecules. But this one I'm about to draw, actually this one kind of should be coming forward towards you, overlap with the hydrogen. But again, that angle between those should be 109.5. The angle between these two should be 109.5. All the angles are 109.5. And then the last one actually kind of goes behind the board. So it's going back 
There's a hydrogen back there that overlaps. I get another overlap there. So I get a tetrahedral three-dimensional molecule formed by the overlap of orbitals. But what's weird about that is if I thought about what we learned in chapter six about carbon, it's a second shell element. Carbon has a 2s orbital in its valence shell, and then it has a set of 2p orbitals in its valence shell. And the p orbitals, one's on the x-axis, one's on the y-axis, and one's on the z-axis. If the orbitals are all on the axes, that means they should be perpendicular to each other. So any bonds I form between the p orbitals ought to have an angle of 90 degrees. And then that s orbital, which is just a sphere, I mean, that one could form a bond anywhere, but the p's are kind of locked in that they should be 90 degrees apart. So essentially what that means is, even though we know that carbon, when, it's, when carbon is an atom by itself, it, ha it has certain places where it likes to put its electrons. Remember, an orbital is just a mathematical equation to describe the place where electrons are likely to be. It's a probability cloud where they're telling you where there's a high probability of finding electrons. This model here basically shows us that the place where carbon keeps its electrons when it's an atom by itself is not the same as the places where carbon keeps the electrons when it starts making bonds. The electrons are moving to new locations to create different orbitals that are not 90 degrees from each other. Okay. Also, if we study the length of the orbitals, p orbitals have a certain length that they stick out from the nucleus. S orbitals are kind of ball, the spheres are balls. These orbitals that we formed, they're not short like what would be formed when I form when I use the s orbital. They're not long like a p orbital. They're somewhere in between. So essentially what scientists have said is when carbon makes bonds, it doesn't use an s orbital. It doesn't use p orbitals. It kind of recombines them in different ways. It develops new orbitals that are not s's and not p's. They're somewhere in between. Okay. So we use the term hybrid, kind of like a biologist would use the term hybrid, where if you cross two different species, then the offspring that comes from those two species when they have uh, a, a child or whatever uh, is a hybrid. Okay, so if you cross a tall pea plant with a short pea plant, often you'll come up with a medium sized pea plant. It's somewhere in between. You know, if I'm really tall, my wife's really short, if we have kids, our kids are probably going to be in between our heights. Okay, so that's kind of how that works. Uh, we kind of connect it to genetics in terms of the terminology we use. But the idea is when carbon starts forming bonds, the orbitals and the locations that it uses to hold its electrons might change and they won't be S orbitals, they won't be P orbitals, they're gonna be something in between. Okay, so we're gonna demonstrate that with a couple of quick examples. So when I look at CH4, I'm going to go from, I'm going to think about for my center atom, I'm going to think about what atomic orbitals that center atom has, but then I'm going to change those orbitals, hybridize, which essentially is kind of like my atomic orbitals are the ingredients I start with. So if I'm baking a cake. I'll start out with like flour and sugar and eggs. I'm going to throw them in a mixing bowl, mix them all up, and let's say I want to make cupcakes. When I pour them into different cups, I could take four ingredients over here, mix them together, and each ingredient is different. But once I make my product, all the cupcakes are going to be the same. So I'm blending them and coming out with a bunch of uniform orbitals that are all identical to each other. Okay? So, carbon's atomic orbitals is in the second shell, so it has a 2s orbital, and it has a, uh, three 2p orbitals. That's the orbitals that it starts with. 
when I hybridize, I look over here and a key thing I have to look at, I need to know what the steric number is. The number of regions of electron domain, the steric number is four. Now what that means is I'm going to need to use four of my orbitals to make these new orbitals that I have. Because there is a rule, however many orbitals I take from the, the atomic orbitals, I'm going to produce the same number of hybrid orbitals when I come over here. So in this case, I need four hybrid orbitals to put my electrons in. So I'm going to use one, two, three, four. I'm going to use all four orbitals in this case. Okay, this will make more sense as we see more examples. But since I need four groups around my center atom, I'm going to use all four orbitals. I'm going to mix them together. And I'm going to come out with four new orbitals that are all equal to each other in energy and shape. So the, the S orbital is like a ball. The P orbitals are long, skinny dumbbells. When I mix them together, my new hybrid orbitals, they're not going to be a ball. They're not going to be long. They're going to be somewhere in between. So like my S orbital looks like that. My P orbital looks like that. When I blend them, my hybrid orbital is going to look something like that. It still kind of has the shape of a P orbital, but it's shorter and stubbier like an S orbital. This is a hybrid orbital right here. Now, if I use four orbitals over here, we do have to conserve the number of orbitals. So if I use four over there, I have to get four over here. I'm going to name these based on what I used. The the second shell is not important. I use the S orbital, and then I use all three of the P orbitals. So my hybrids are going to be called SP3 hybrid orbitals. Now, their shapes have blended, but beyond that, I also energy-wise, my P orbitals have this much energy, my S orbital has this much energy, my new hybrids have to be somewhere in between. They're an average energy level from what I mix together. Okay, so those new orbitals, when I put them on the carbon atom, they're going to spread out in whatever shape is the best spacing, which is why these new orbitals I make, they're going to spread out into a tetrahedral arrangement. Now, why do they do that? Well, if we make four equal orbitals, we've already said the electrons like to be as far away from each other as they can. So we can put those in whatever arrangement we want to, or we should say the atom can put the electrons wherever it is best energetically. And if I have four orbitals, four groups of electrons, tetrahedral is the shape that would make the most sense. Okay, so now let's talk about the electrons themselves. If carbon, we know that carbon normally has four dots around it, four valence electrons. In the normal atomic orbitals, that would be one, two, three, four. That's how carbon would normally arrange its electrons if it were just a carbon atom by itself. And we said when we drew Lewis dot structures, carbon, if it has four dots, it needs to make four bonds to get its octet. Well, if I look at this arrangement, to make a bond, an atom has to put one electron in an orbital and extend it towards another atom. The other atom puts one electron in and extends it, and when they overlap, while both orbitals had one electron each, when they overlap with each other, now they both get to count both electrons. So we can only make bonds if an orbital has one electron in it. So based on that, this orbital is ready to make a bond. This orbital is ready to make a bond. This one's empty, so it can't really do anything. And this orbital is already full. If he tried to overlap with another orbital that had electrons in it, that would break the rules where only two electrons can be in each orbital. So basically, the way carbon's set up, it could never make the four bonds it needs. It has to redistribute its electrons in a different way. So we don't really know why or how it happens, but we do know that a carbon atom by itself looks like this, and then it changes everything 
before it makes a molecule. When it makes a molecule, it looks like this. There's four equivalent orbitals. They're all about the same length. They're spread out into a tetrahedron. And now when I put my four electrons in, one, two, since they're all equal, I put one in each. One, two, three, four. Now all four orbitals have one electron each. They're all ready to make a bond. Okay? And each one of those is going to make a sigma bond to one of the hydrogen atoms, which explains how our structure forms. Okay? So this is our first example. This will make a lot more sense when you see a few more examples in the next video. So take a look.